Well, Father, we're thankful for your word for us tonight, and we pray that uh, as we gather together here, we think about this question of justice and what it means to put things to rights, that we focus first and foremost on Jesus Christ, who is our justice and the one who promises eternal rest. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we're really dealing with, um, there's two different sections here, and they really sh should be two different lessons, but uh, one of them's short enough that uh, it couldn't really stand on its own for, for one of our Bible studies, so we're going to combine it with it. Um, the other part of that is, uh, is this section here in 24, uh, 10 and, and to the end of the chapter there, um, doesn't really fit with what comes before it and, and what comes after it. So the reason that it gets put uh, here in the middle uh, of these passages um, is probably one of two things. Uh, one, it fits thematically. And there's a little bit of theme to this of sitting in between two sections dealing with what, what we've called holy time, um, where it's dealing with um, to whom do the laws apply? And when you live in this place, is this do the laws apply to you? A little bit has to do with that. Uh, Jubilee, uh, which is what we'll be dealing with in chapter 25 and the Sabbath year rest, uh, do have questions of justice associated with them. So there's a thematic connection there. Um, but Chase Kalar makes the point, and, and I'll uh, agree with him because I don't have any reason not to, um, that probably the reason this passage is where it is is because this, is, this event happened in the midst of these uh, revelations uh, concerning holy times. Um, and so we're dealing with uh, justice, right? And specifically, to whom do the laws of God apply, right? Um, and so that's an open question. And what is the extent of justice that can be meted out, especially justice for um, someone who is from, um, in this case, a hated oppressor class, uh, the Egyptians? Right. And is there a limit to what can be done? Right. Um, and the answer is going to be yes. Right. And so this is where we'll get uh, kind of the famous Lex Telonius, uh, that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, Telonius tooth, law of the tooth. Um, and this idea that there is a ceiling, right, that the uh, or we put it in the English common law tradition that the punishment must fit the crime. Right. The punishment must fit the crime. Right? That's the idea here. Uh, so Jesus himself uh, comments on this uh, in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5, uh, and so we're going to take a look at what Jesus has to say uh, and let that help us to understand uh, the proper interpretation of Leviticus, right? So Jesus said, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And so Jesus is not uh, rejecting, right? He is not rejecting uh, the uh, Lex Telonius, the idea of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that the punishment must fit the crime. Rather, he is saying that in your interpersonal relationships, uh, that the idea of justice that is meted out by the state, right? So that would be Jesus' understanding of how this works. That the justice that's meted out by the state does not apply. In other words, you can't take justice into your own hands, right? If somebody slaps you on the face, that doesn't mean you get to turn around and slap that person back. Just because somebody did something that was wrong to you doesn't mean you get to return the wrong. Right? And the same thing is going to happen in our Leviticus passage today, right? So one of the ideas of what's going to happen here is that you can't take matters into your own hands. There must be a process for first ascertaining guilt, uh, and second, for meeting out proper punishment. In other words, you can't just simply say, this person did me wrong, and so I get to go and return wrong for them. Now, if you watch children on playgrounds, uh, you will sometimes hear them uh, do these kinds of things. So a kid punches another kid, and the kid cries and says, I'm going to go tell the teacher or something along those lines. It's just, no, 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 stop. You can punch me back, right? You can punch me back, right? And then I punch you, then you punch me. Now we're even. Right? So that's the idea. We're meeting out uh, justice that way, as in uh, we're keeping things even, right? And that's specifically what Jesus is rejecting here. Jesus does not reject, right, in his famous saying, you know, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render unto God the things that are God. 
right? Jesus does not reject the idea that the state has a legitimate role to play in the world, right? God ordained the state to carry out uh, his justice in the world. The state can be better or worse at that, and we'll leave that, you know, for your own personal judgment on how things are going, but the state has a role to play. So as we turn our attention over to our Leviticus passage, right, it is, that's not Leviticus, that is Matthew. Let's get to Leviticus. Sorry about this. As we turn our attention over to Leviticus, right, it's that specific idea of justice. Who gets to give out justice? What are the limits of justice? Can I uh, give out justice on my own or do I have to go through a proper channel in order to bring in wealth? Right. So here's the scenario. Let's start here in chapter 24, verse 10. Now an Israelite woman's son, whose father was an Egyptian, went out from among the people of Israel. And the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought in the camp. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name and cursed. Okay, so here's the scenario. Okay, a man born to an Israelite mother and an Egyptian father has gone with his mother during the Exodus experience out into the wilderness. Right, so there at Sinai, he is there. And he gets into a fight in the camp with an Israelite. Now, because probably of his Egyptian heritage, because he has been raised by his Egyptian father, right, he has a low view of the Israelites and of the Israelite God, and so he blasphemes and curses the name, right? This isn't just, you know, swearing something, you know, saying something, you know, that you might say while you're sitting, hear somebody say while they're sitting in traffic, uh, as bad as those things may be, as bad as those things may be, this is something uh, more than that. Right. This is specifically saying uh, that, that Yahweh is to be cursed, right? Um, probably a more colorful language than I did use, but I am a pastor, right? This is saying that your God is not worthy of worship and praise, or my God is better than your God, right? That's the level of blasphemy and curse. Now, again, I'm saying this in very polite language, and what seems to be clear from the text here. Uh, is that the Egyptian uh, man, right, the, man, the son of the Egyptian, uh, is not using such language. Now, this creates uh, an interesting side path uh, that really isn't the central focus of the text here, uh, but it is important for us to understand in the world, right, how, does one, how is one counted as belonging to Israel, right? And so that's part of what's going to be decided here. Does the law apply to this one, right? Is this one living amongst the people of Israel, also subject to Israel's laws. And Israel uh, and God, Israel's God, Yahweh, says, yes. Yes, the law does apply to him. And this will eventually lead to the idea that uh, one establishes their position inside of Israel because of one's maternal uh, parentage, right? So whoever your mother is, if your mother's a Jew, then you are a Jew, right? So that's the idea that eventually will emerge uh, coming out of this text. Now, that's not directly what's going on here, because you may also recall that, that laws apply equally to the um, resident alien, right, to the sojourner or the foreigner living amongst the people of Israel as much as they apply to Israel uh, itself. So, scenario here, this man has gotten in a fight with an Israelite, right? That's not the issue. The issue is blasphemy. He's taken the name of God the King and has cursed it. Right. In other words, he has insulted the King as a way of insulting people of the King. Okay. And people hear it because it happens in the middle of the camp. Then they brought him to Moses. His name was Shalomith, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in custody. Right, till the will of the Lord should be clear to them. Right? So they're not sure what to do. Right? And so they're going to consult with the Lord, specifically Moses. Right? And so they're going to keep him under house arrest or under tent arrest, I guess as the case may be. Uh, they're going to keep him under uh, arrest until such time as they decide what can be done with him. He has clearly violated the law. It happens in the middle of the camp. People hear the blaspheming of the name of the Lord God. Right? And so now the question is, what should we do in this particular case of blasphemy? Okay? And God responds to Moses, right? God responds to Moses, verse 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, bring 
uh, out of the camp, the one who cursed and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head and let all the congregation stone him. Right? So the Lord himself is going to pass judgment here, right? saying you have to go outside the camp because death is going to be involved. Right? You're going to stone this man to death. And that has, remember, those concentric rings, right, culminating in the holy of holy places. Well, they extend all the way out to the camp. And then beyond the camp is the outer world. And in the outer world, uh, that's where death is acceptable. Right? Death can exist out there because it doesn't have any layers of holiness or any layers of purity uh, associated with it. Uh, and so he has to be taken outside of the camp. Then those who are witnesses, right? those who heard him say what he, what he said, they have to come forward and have to lay their hands on him. In other words, they have to say, I heard it and I am testifying that this man, this is the man who has done this, right? It is positive identification that this man uh, is guilty as charged, right? You can think of this as a jury of your peers, right? So they're coming forward and they're saying, I heard it, he did it, right? And then all the congregation is going to pick up stones and stone him. Now, all the congregation uh, here is specifically masculine. It refers to all the men of Israel, right? But every man in Israel has to take part uh, in the stoning death of this man, right? And the idea there is it's no one man in Israel who is responsible for executing him. But rather, this is the act of the state, right? This is the act of the nation, the act of the people, right? Passing judgment, uh, God passes judgment and the people are carrying out the sentence that God has given to them, okay? And then uh, Moses is to speak to the people of Israel, saying, whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death, right? So to insult the king is to invite death, right? To cut it, it, What you are doing by insulting or cursing or blaspheming the Lord, what you're doing is saying, the one who has given me life, right? The very author of life, the creator of all things, including me, right? I am in the position to judge the Lord, not the other way around, right? And so the moment you do that, you remove yourself uh, from the Lord's care, right? You remove yourself from under the hand of the Lord's grace, right? And when you and, and incur God's just wrath for doing so, right? You have cut yourself off from the source of life and all that is left for you is death, right? And so your death comes swiftly and in this case, brutally, right? So all the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native when he blasphemes the name shall be put to death, right? So this is a blanket statement, right? We've seen some of this stuff already in the moral sections that we dealt with a couple of weeks ago, right? So the sentence here is set, you can think of this as a minimum sentence, right? And the sentence is clearly this one, uh, you blaspheme the name of the Lord, right? You blaspheme Yahweh, then you will be put to death in Israel. So it's a strong deterrent to tell you, don't do that. Don't do that. So the Lord gives a general rule to reject the Lord, the creator and savior is to forfeit the life he gives. So that's what's going on in the text. So uh, this leads us to a more general principle of justice, right? And again, the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth um, is often misunderstood and treated as if it is brutal. And what I'm trying to tell you is there, if you look at, I always say, uh, uh, Celia Verambe, but it's not that. It's her or um, If you look at other ancient codes of law, um, they are far more brutal, right? One of the nice things about Israel is the law applies equally to everyone, right? And it doesn't matter who did the, who did the wrong thing and who the wrong thing was done against, as it does in most of the rest of the ancient world, right? It matters which status, which class you are, right? And those underneath you, you can do whatever you want to them. That's even still true to a large extent in the Greco-Roman state. Uh, at the time of Jesus. Um, so what we're saying here is that the law applies equally to everyone. No one is above the law, right? We have a word for this. We call this the rule of law, right? So the law itself is the, is the rule, right? And everyone is measured against the law. Right? It doesn't matter if you are a prince or if you are a pauper, the same law applies to everyone. So the Lex Talonius that we find here, the eye for an eye, two for a tooth law, uh, is meant to establish a principle of justice. And that principle of justice, as we covered earlier, is that the crime or, or the punishment must fit the crime, right? The punishment must fit the crime. In other words, um, you have to get out of the cycle of vengeance, right? So the cycle of vengeance is pretty clear, right? I insult you, you push me. You push me, I punch you. Um, 
I punch you, you stab me. You stab me, I shoot you. You shoot, I shoot you, you kill me, right? You kill um, me, my friends kill your family, right? Your, and then all of a sudden you're in the Hatfields and the McCoys, right? It's just this cycle of revenge that escalates and escalates and escalates until there is chaos and destruction, right? And so one of the things that's supposed to happen here with the Lex Delenius is it's supposed to be a defeat of the need for revenge. Now, remember, Christians themselves are told uh, that it is mine to avenge, says the Lord, like in Romans chapter 12. Um, the Lord says, no, it is not your place to take vengeance. Justice and vengeance are mine. It is your place to be a people of grace, right? To be a people of grace. You've received grace, be gracious toward others, right? Let the Lord, right, mete out his justice in his own way, specifically through the state. So let's take a look at what the text has to say. Now, the, um, we're going to find here uh, pretty early on that we are forming um, what's known as a chiasm. Right, so verses 17 through 21 form a chiasm. So we're going to talk about taking human life, taking animal life, the general rule, taking animal life, taking human life, right? And so it's any chiastic structure, what's at the center of the structure is the most important part. So we start with verse 17, whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Right? So a crime against the image bearer of God, specifically one that would murder that person, right? We're not talking about manslaughter or, you know, an accidental killing, right? There are different laws that will apply to that, including cities of refuge. Um, we're not talking about death in, in warfare that would be seen as a separate category. What we're talking about here is the intentional taking of the life of another human being, right? This is murder. This is what we're talking about, right? So if you do that, then according to God's word in Israel, then the just, um, the just re, uh, punishment for you taking the life of another person is that your life is now forfeit. But we're going to distinguish in verse 18 crimes against, other, uh, against human beings from crimes against property, right? So whoever takes an animal's life shall make it good life for life. So if you uh, kill another human, then your life is forfeit. If you uh, kill an animal that belongs to somebody else, uh, then you have to repay that which you took, right? Life for life, right? So either monetarily or by providing an animal of equal or greater value, right? You have to, re you have to make restitution for what you did wrong, right? So here in Leviticus, we are distinguishing between uh, crimes against human beings and crimes against property, right? Crimes against human beings have a much stiffer penalty than crimes against crimes against property, right? Or as I tell my daughters, uh, sometimes when they're doing some silly things, I say, uh, I can replace your stuff, but I can't replace you, right? I can replace your stuff, but I can't replace you. So don't risk your life for something that can be replaced, right? That's not important. Okay. So part of the matter, though, is what's coming here in verses uh, 19 and 20. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done it, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given, a person shall be given to him. Now, we are speaking in the passive voice here, shall be given to him. Right? And so anytime you see a passive verb, you have to wonder who is the subject. Is it the one that you injured who is able to return injury? But depending on the injury, they may not be able to do that. So instead, what the context clearly suggests is that the state, right? So the government is, of the people is the one who steps in to make sure that the justice is meted out properly. Um, so the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth uh, is... Um, on the one hand can be seen as a floor, right? So that means that uh, the punishment must fit the crime. But on the other hand, it's a ceiling, right? It's this and no more. So which one of those is the more powerful thought? And I've always argued it's the second one, right? This is more important that this is a ceiling to what can be done, right? In other words, you cannot exact a greater punishment on the one who has injured you than the injury that they have given to you. Right? We're not punitive right, in the justice that is being meted out here. Right? We are seeking right, to put things to rights right? because they have been, been put off right? either by um, injury 
right, to animals, right? And the animals are the ones that are on the inside here, right? So eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? That's the idea here is uh, that you've harmed the property, right? And so you have to make restitution for it. Or if you've harmed the life of another human, then, then you, your life has now become forfeit. Right? Capital punishment is on the table. Right? But in the modern world, and we certainly would understand this in the New Testament, it is the state that is responsible for doing that, not the individual human being. Right? We don't want vigilantes and we don't want mob justice. Right? Neither one of those things uh, is acceptable. So then we move out of the central concept here, right? And the central concept is a limit on what can be done and an equal application of the law, right? That forecloses escalation of revenge. And then we move out of that back into the other end of the chiasm, right? So we talked about humans, then animals, then the general principle. And now we're going to talk about animals and then humans. Pardon me. Never mind. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good, and whoever kills a person shall be put to death, right? So if you've injured property, you make it right. If you've killed another human being, that life is not coming back, right? And so your life is now forfeit, right? That's the justice that's going to be given out. Okay, now the wider context here is not so much this. We can find uh, this idea in uh, Exodus, for instance. The wider context here suggests that the idea that's important is to whom does this apply, right? To whom does this, does this general rule apply? Right? And the general rule, we are told in verse 22 and following, you shall have the same rule for the sojourner and for the native, for I am the Lord your God. In other words, if the, if the person, no matter if they are a born Israelite or if they are living amongst Israel right, in the land, the same law applies to everyone, right? Because God is God of everyone not only God of Israel, right? So everyone is subject to the law. Everyone sits under the law. Uh, everyone is going to be punished according to the law's dictates. So this leads us down to a uh, conclusionary uh, sentence here uh, at the end of this passage. So Moses spoke to the people of Israel. They brought out of the camp the one who cursed and stoned him with stones. The people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. Right, so the people carry out the Lord's judgment on the man, right? So in the end, who is responsible uh, for the man who's cursed death? Well, in, in one sense, it's him. And in the other sense, it's the Lord. So remember, the Lord is the Lord of life, right? And to curse, to insult, to blaspheme is to cut yourself off from the source of life. And cutting yourself off from the source of life sub submits you to death. That's what happens in the passage. Is it brutal? Well, yeah, compared to how we think in the world today, but uh, on the other side, they are trying to establish, right, a holy people, right? And if you have those living amongst you who will not live by the holy law of God, uh, then this is what will result, right? So this is the result. So let's jump down uh, into uh, uh, really a almost a complete total change of subject. So if we want to look at the end of chapter 24 and say, this is what happens when you have um, done something wrong in justice and, and the, to, to restore what is right, justice must be meted out, right? So now the question is, well, what about redemption, right? Is there a way for grace and mercy to have uh, a role in all of this, right? Can we put things to right uh, in, in a fashion that doesn't involve um, putting people to death, for instance. Right? So the theme of chapter 25 is redemption. To redeem something uh, means to restore it to wholeness, right? or to restore it to its rightful owner, or to restore it to its historic owner, I guess as the case may be. Since the family is the foundation of society, it's as true then as it is now, these laws strengthen family ties and maintain a place in the land for everyone. To have your own portion of the inheritance Right, is to have economic livelihood secured, right? Is to have your economic livelihood secured. To be without land in a predominantly agrarian subsistence farming culture uh, is to be uh, without the means to support yourself and for your family. Sabbath principles, including the Sabbath year and Jubilee, protected people, property, and livestock from overuse. 
and also prevented the arising of a feudal system of lords and serfs, where you had people that owned and people that were owned, right? And so since we're trying to um, get away from that system, right, we have to establish a way for things to be restored to their order of inheritance, right? The laws are not mentioned further in the biblical record. So laws concerning the Sabbath year uh, and uh, the Jubilee. So we do not know if Israel was adherent to these laws, uh, but there's some indication in the biblical record that uh, lack of inheritance may be a cause of the exile. So if we jump over into, oh, that's not the passage I want. If we jump over into uh, Second Chronicles, 36, nope, 36, and we'll jump down to here. Okay, we are told that as the exile is approaching, right? So therefore he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with the sword and the house of the sanctuary had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, treasures of the house of the Lord and treasures of the king and of his princes, all of these he brought to Babylon, and they burned the house of God, and broke down the walls of Jerusalem, and burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious vessels. He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years, right? So one of the ideas here coming from the end in verse 21 here. Uh, is that Israel was not adherent to the laws that we are about to study, right? And so therefore, part of what led to the exile is a sort of backlog of these Sabbath years that they were supposed to keep. Now, in Nehemiah 10.31, we find this. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. and We will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt, right? So Nehemiah is on the other end of the exile, right? We're trying to restore order in, in, in Jerusalem specifically, but in Israel in general, right? And so the idea here is we need to return to Sabbath keeping, including the keeping of at least the Sabbath year, but by extension, you would also say probably the Jubilee year uh, in order to restore uh, that which was lost. Now, it's also clear by the time of Jesus that this is not happening anymore, right? So this was a short-lived idea. Chase Kalar says uh, on page 298 of its commentary, it indicates that the Israelites had little faith in the Lord's provision and their priorities were out of keeping with the Lord's vision for the world. This should not surprise us. We disobey to this day for much the same reasons. So, what I'm trying to tell you is we don't know for certain whether or not Israel was ever adherent to this set of laws, but this set of laws is given to Israel so that they can find their rest uh, in the Lord, but also so that they can trust in his provision, right? So it is their lack of faith in the Lord that leads to them neglecting these laws. So let's deal with 1 through 22, which are laws for the Sabbath year and laws of Jubilee. So in 1 through 7, we find this. Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, right? So this is part of the Sinai revelation, very important for us to remember where we are when all of this is happening. Saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years, you shall sow your fields and for six years, you shall prune your vineyards and gather in its roots. But in the seventh year, that shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. Shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vine. Shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. The Sabbath of the land shall provide food for you, for yourself and for your male and female servants and for your hired worker and the sojourner who lives with you, for your cattle and for the wild animals that are in your land. All its yields shall be for food. So in the Sabbath year, we cannot um, cultivate food. So it, these laws are going to take effect when Israel takes the land of Canaan for itself. Right. They established that every seventh year, uh, the land will be given a fallow, will be laid fallow, will be given a year of rest. So no agricultural work, planting, pruning, harvesting could take place, but you could go out and pick wild berries, for instance, that wouldn't be considered um, cultivated agriculture. 
right? And you can use whatever the land produced naturally, but not what your fields have produced, even if what's growing up is what was uh, sort of left over from last year. Even resident aliens were given rest uh, during this Sabbath rest, since the Lord is the God of all people and all people uh, belong to him. And so all people are worthy of his rest. That idea we're going to come back to in Hebrews uh, in just a little bit. So let's jump down into verses 18 uh, through 13 here. You shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years shall be given you 49 years. And you shall sound the loud trumpet on the 10th day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. You shall sound the trumpet throughout all the land and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it, you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself nor gather the grapes from the endless vine. For its jubilee, it shall be holy to you. You may eat the produce of the field. So here's how this works. Right, so you get seven of these Sabbath years. And after the seventh Sabbath year, right? After the seventh of the seventh Sabbath year, that, don't say that 10 times fast. <laughs> then you get an additional year of rest called the year of Jubilee. During the year of Jubilee, all of the inheritance is going to reset and return to its family of origin, right? So you may have leased out or sold your land. You may have leased out or sold it yourself. Frankly, we'll come to that in a little bit. Um, but in the 50th year, everything is reset, right? Back to the way it was, right? And so everyone is able to return and to restore themselves uh, in the land. And during that 50th year, you uh, once again are not able to eat anything cultivated. You can eat things that grow wild. Uh, you can eat things that you have saved up in prior years. Uh, and you may also eat of the produce of the field. In other words, that which is going to grow up naturally. So you couldn't do that in the seventh year, but you can do that uh, in the Jubilee year. Okay, begins on the day of atonement, right? And so it's going to signal a year of God's grace, a year of his rest, a year of his favor. And it begins on the day when everything is put to rights and ends the day before. Uh, the Day of Atonement, right? So we've seen what already the central role of the Day of Atonement uh, in Israel. So in this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his property. So we're going to be dealing more specifically with what this means. Okay, if you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. Okay, so no shady deals. Okay, you shall pay your neighbor according to the number of years after the Jubilee, and he shall sell to you according to the number of years for crops. The years are many, you shall increase the price of the years are few, you shall reduce the price versus the number of the crops that he's selling to you. So since everything resets in the Jubilee year, right, in essence, you're never, you're not selling things in the technical sense, you're leasing them to others, right? You're leasing the land to somebody else, right? And so the price is based on how long uh, that lease can last because in the year of Jubilee, all of the leases are canceled and everything returns back to its original owners okay? or to the family. Uh, uh, that is uh, that is originally over the inheritance. Okay, you shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. Okay, so don't use this as an opportunity, right, to extract more or less money, depending on the system, uh, or the rather the the time until jubilee, right. But instead, because you fear God, and because God is the one who is giving you everything, and because in the end it all belongs to Him. Right, then you are going to treat each other fairly as those whom God has saved. Okay, so let's jump down here. God is going to promise provision here in 18 to 22. Therefore, you shall do my statutes and keep my rules and perform them. Then you will dwell in the land securely. The land will yield its fruit and you will eat your fill and dwell in it securely. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? We may not sow or gather in our crop. I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year. So produce a crop sufficient for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating some of the old crop. You shall eat the old until the ninth year when the crop arrives, right? So in other words, you're going to harvest enough grain in the sixth year that it will sustain you until the new crop comes in, uh, in essence, three years down the road. It's a long time and take a lot of faith to do this, right? To, and it would also take uh, understanding, you know, that this is a requirement 
uh, and setting aside that which God has given, right? So you're not going to surplus it off. You're not going to sell it off. Right? You're not going to eat too much, right? You, you are going to set aside the portion uh, that you need for those two years, right? That you are not going to be allowed to plant. And so that idea right, means a little bit of forethought and a little bit of planning ahead. Now, again, as we covered earlier, um, there's some indication from the text that Israel does not do this, or at least doesn't do it consistently as they should. Um, there's no indication, the text never, the, the Old Testament never mentions them celebrating Jubilee. It certainly talks about the importance of Jubilee, and Isaiah brings forward the Jubilee symbol, something that Jesus will pick up in Luke chapter 4. But there's no clear indication that they either did or did not practice this, uh, although the text we read from uh, Second Chronicles, uh, as well as Nehemiah, seem to indicate uh, that they did, at least had fallen off from practicing this uh, and matters needed to be restored. All right, so what about the redemption of property? Okay, so we redeem property in the Sabbath year, things return, we do leases based on this. Okay, so as we jump down into verses uh, 23 to 55, we're talking the theme of redemption is going to come uh, to the forefront uh, and how redemption relates, uh, how redemption relates to the year of Jubilee. So um, verses uh, 23 and 24 uh, are going to give us a general rule. So the land shall not be sold in perpetuity for the land is mine. Right, so the Lord says, this belongs to me. You can't sell it to each other because it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to me. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the country you possess, you shall allow redemption of the land. Right? So you, uh, even if you have leased things in the land, then you have to allow for a kinsman redeemer or even for the very person himself uh, to pay off the lease, right? To pay off what needs to be paid off and to have the land restored early. Okay. So how do you get yourself into these predicaments? Well, we're going to deal with um, really uh, three main scenarios here. Um, selling some land to cover debt, selling all your land to cover debt, uh, selling all your land and yourself and possibly your family to cover debt. Right? So all three of those scenarios are going to be covered here. Um, you know, there's all sorts of reasons that people would incur debt, same things that a lot of farmers end up getting themselves in trouble with, right? So you, um, you have to uh, buy seed or equipment or something along those lines, uh, and then uh, you have a bad year, right? You have crop failure, pretty common, especially in the ancient world, very common, right? So you have crop failure. So the next year, right, you need to borrow even more in order to try to cover that year. Uh, and then pretty soon, you know, you know, if that crop fails, then all of a sudden you're in, you're in hock up to your eyeballs pretty quick, right? And so you have to be able to um, pay your debt, right? And so if you're out of things of value, right, your property, uh, then you sell yourself. In the ancient world, that's how it worked, right? We don't like slavery in the modern world for good reason. Slavery is evil and wrong. And we shouldn't do it. Um, but in the ancient world, um, what's happening in Israel here is what we would uh, more probably rightly term uh, indentured servitude rather than uh, slavery itself, right? It's not quite the same thing uh, because there is an expiration date for it, right? It doesn't go on interminably, right? And um, in, in the case of other Israelites, right? so the in-group, right, cannot be permanently enslaved. They can take as permanent slaves people from the out-group. So it changes in Christianity, and it takes us mm. around 1,800 years to get this right, is that we begin to understand, right, that every person, uh, every human being that bears the image of God is in the in-group, right? and so it's not okay to enslave anyone, right? In other words, there is no out-group, and so slavery uh, cannot be allowed. Uh, there's still slavery in the world today, practiced in many parts. Right? But in the United States, um, we fought a war to end slavery, and we did that for the um, it, we did the right thing in doing so. Right? You can argue about the origins of the Civil War, but in the end, the Civil War became a battle to end slavery, and that's exactly what happened. And praise God that it did. Okay, so let's deal with these scenarios, shall we? So scenario one: you need to sell some of your property to cover debt. So if your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. Right? So you've 
you, you find out that your relative has run into a hard time, right? Somebody probably from your clan, or maybe closer than that, the immediate family, right? So you found out somebody has fallen onto hard time uh, and they have sold some of their property, then it is incumbent upon you to go and redeem that, right? So that you own the lease uh, to the property uh, and not the man, right? And so then you can restore your brother to the land uh, and he can continue. So if a man has no one to redeem it, right? So let's say either you don't have close kin or your close kin is in as much trouble as you are, right? So no one to redeem it and then find himself becomes prosperous and find sufficient means to redeem it. Let him calculate the year since he sold it and pay back, to the, pay back the balance to the man to whom he sold it and then return to his property, right? So there's no one else to redeem it, but your things turn around, things start going your way. Um, you know, you, you, God's providence comes in and all of a sudden you have the money to redeem it. Then you, in essence, calculate um, how much you owe and you pay back what is owed. Right? Well, you pay back what is owed uh, on the land, right? So you can save up and redeem it yourself, right? And this, and so you would work out the appropriate price based on what was left in the lease. And that's what you would pay to restore. Okay. But so kinsman redeemer, redeem it yourself. But if you don't have a kinsman redeemer and you can't redeem it yourself, that's where we get in the final scenario there. If he does not have sufficient means to recover it, then what he sold shall remain in the hand of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. In the year of Jubilee, it shall be released and he shall return to his property, right? So that could be as much as, you know, if this happened the year after the Jubilee, right? So this could be as much as 48 years. So maybe not even you, but maybe your children who are uh, having the land restored uh, to them. All right, so that's what's going on uh, here in this particular scenario uh, is we are dealing with um, partial selling of the land and being able to redeem it, right? So the red right of redemption, the right of restoring the land by payment of, of, of the lease, right? That, that has to be allowed, right? And even if it's not redeemed with money, the year of Jubilee resets things back to their family of origin, so to speak. Okay, so what about, uh, this is kind of a, a side matter here, dealing with houses and uh, cities, including houses in Levite cities. So the Levites uh, inheritance is different than the rest of Israel. Uh, the Levites uh, have scattered cities and then fields surrounding those cities uh, throughout Israel. And so the laws, um, because the Levites only have their cities in the fields around them, the laws of the Levite cities are going to be different than the rest. Okay. So the basic rule here is there's a difference between living in a walled city and living in an unwalled village, right? So a walled city means that it's not attached to the lands that surround it, right? And so property can be bought and sold permanently, uh, but a village, right, unwalled city, uh, the houses are attached to the fields that surround them, and so therefore they cannot be sold in perpetuity. Okay, so let's read that real quick. Man sells a dwelling house in a walled city. He may redeem it within a year of its sale. For a full year, he shall have the right of redemption. So number one, you sell your house, right? You have a year to decide to change your mind, right? Or to repay the house. Now, probably if you're selling the house, uh, it's to cover debt, right? That seems to be the prevailing uh, theme of, the chap of this part of the chapter. So you're trying to cover debt, right? And so you are going to sell your house uh, to cover your debt, but within a year, right, if you have earned back the money or you found a way, uh, a kinsman redeemer, perhaps, uh, then you can have the house restored to you, right? So you have a year to redeem it. But after a year, it cannot be redeemed. So if it's not redeemed within a full year, then the house in the walled city shall belong in perpetuity to the buyer throughout his generations. It shall not be released in the Jubilee. Right? So this is an exception to the rule right? in the walled city, since it's not connected to uh, economic livelihood is not connected to cultivatable land, right? It can be bought and sold in perpetuity. But the houses of the villages that have no wall around them shall be classified with the fields of the land. So those houses are seen as connected to the fields around them, probably because they are. <laughs> and so therefore, they can't be sold in perpetuity. They may be redeemed and they shall be released in the Jubilee, right? So you have a year of redemption, right? Perhaps even permanent redemption law of redemption, right? But in the year of Jubilee, they are restored to the family. Levites, as we already covered, are a special case, so we have to deal with them 
in a special way. As a, for the cities of the Levites, the Levites may redeem at any time the houses in the city they possess, right? So you always have the right of redemption in, in the city. If you are a Levite, right, it doesn't expire after the year. One of the Levites exercises his right of redemption, then the house that was sold in the city they possess shall be released in the Jubilee, right? So if you um, could not afford it or you didn't redeem it, then um, that year Jubilee resets things. For the houses in the cities of the Levites and their possession among the people of Israel, right? So they have a different kind of inheritance, right? They're kind of scattered throughout the land, salt and light from Jesus' own imagery. Right? And so they need to be able to be re redeem their, uh, their houses. But the fields of pasture land belonging to their cities may not be sold, for that is their possession forever. Right? So you can't take possession of Levite fields right? in, in any way. It's their possession forever, and they can't be sold. So if you're a Levite, you're pretty limited in the way you can cover your debts. Just as it's kind of a, a price of being part of the uh, sort of the, the clan of the or the tribe of the priests. Okay, so we've dealt with selling some of your property. Now we're going to deal in 35 to 38 with still selling all of your property. If your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and a sojourner and he shall live with you. Take no interest from him or profit, but fear your God that your brother may live beside you. You shall not lend him your money at interest or give him your food for profit. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. Right, so he sold all of his property, right? And if you are in possession of it, then you are to treat him, right? Um, you're to treat him as, in essence, a, a, a hired hand, right? So he's got to share crop with uh, probably the field, so he's going to continue to live on the field and take food for his family from the field, um, or he's going to have food sold to him, but you're not going to charge him, you're not going to loan him money at interest, right? So you're not going to charge usury, right? And nor are you going to sell him food for a profit, right? You, that would be um, putting him and his family into destitution, and you don't want to do that, right? You don't want to make them destitute. Right? And more than that, you need to show mercy because God has shown mercy, right? He brought you out of slavery, out of a land, all right, that was not your own, to give you a land that will be your own, right? Because it is God's land and you are God's people. So therefore, you should treat others uh, in a difficult position uh, with kindness. Okay, so that's selling uh, all of the property. What about selling yourself? Now, quick side note. Uh, the Bible talks about slavery as, as something that was real in the ancient world. It's real in the whole world uh, until uh, really pretty recently in human history. Um, the Bible is not saying slavery is particularly good. In fact, um, there are other passages in the Torah that say, you know, staying a slave, not something an Israelite should want to do. Right? You were slaves. You were delivered from slavery. Don't go back to slavery. Right? So this idea will be picked up in the New Testament. Uh, with the idea of returning back to the sin that had ensnared you, right? You were a slave to sin. Don't go back to your old master. So for instance, Paul in Romans 7 uh, makes a point along those lines. Okay. So if your brother becomes poor uh, beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and as a sojourner. Right? So he's going to be uh, what we might think of as an indentured servant. Right? Yes, he's going to work for you. But you have to pay him, right? He sold himself to you. He's, in other words, saying, my labor belongs to you, but you can't treat him, right? You can't mistreat him. You have to treat him as if he's a hired hand, right? And you have to give him uh, funds, right? In fact, he may even be able to raise enough funds working for you that he can buy his own freedom uh, and, and buy back um, his land, right? So he shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. So you can't keep him longer than the year of Jubilee. Right, and then he's free. Then he shall go out from you, he and his children with him, and go back to his own clan and return to the possession of his fathers, right? So you don't own him. You don't own his children that are born to you while he's serving you. You don't own any of them, right? And in the year of Jubilee, when all things are restored, then he also is set free as are his children. It says for, God says, for they are my servants whom I brought up out of the land of Egypt, and they shall not be sold as slaves. In other words, Israel no longer uh, is eligible for slavery, right? Permanent servitude. You shall not rule over them ruthlessly, but shall fear your God. In other words, you don't get to mistreat people. 
just because they owe you money, right? Or because they work for you, you, you don't get to treat them cruelly or it, because you fear God, right? Because in the end, we all belong to God, right? In the end, you have to answer to it. So the household quotes in the New Testament pick up on this idea when they're talking to masters, right? They're saying, look, you serve one man, we all serve one master, and you have to give account to that one master to treat those under your care, including the slaves in your household, treat them with care. Okay. As for your male and female slaves whom you may have, you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are around you. Right? So if they're not, they're in the out group, right? So they're not an Israelite, they may become permanent slaves. You may also buy from among the strangers who sojourn with you and the clans that are with you have been born in your land that they may be your property. Right? You may bequeath them to your sons after you to inherit as possession forever. That's generally not what got done in the ancient world, usually a uh, slave for free at their master's death, but you could uh, hand them on. You may make slaves of them, but over your brothers, be religious, you shall not rule over one uh, over another ruthlessly. Right? So foreign outgroup folks can become permanent slaves. Now, what changes in the New Testament? And it takes a long time to work this out in Christian history. Uh, is the idea that there is no outgroup, right? There is no outgroup. There's only an in-group, right? We are all human beings. All human beings bear the image of God, right? The Imago Dei is not unique to any group of humans, but is rather ubiquitous amongst all humans. Right? And since we all bear the image of God, all of us are from Adam's fallen race, all of us are human beings, Right? regardless of whatever characteristics may, we, we may have, right? whether it's a racial categorization where we defeated another group in battle, right? we're still all human beings, and so slavery is not allowed. Right? In fact, slavery doesn't even really get introduced uh, into uh, Christendom until, well, um, the, the feudal system disallowed slavery. Right? You couldn't make slaves of your own countrymen because they were seen as your in-group. Right? So what Christianity does through its rapid expansion especially in the post-Reformation uh, era, is we begin to see that there is no outgroup, right? Every single human being is a fallen, broken sinner in need of a savior, and Jesus is the savior of the world, right? All of us fit in that, and so there is no outgroup, so we cannot enslave one another, right? We can't treat somebody as if they're foreign. Israel has, a definitive, has definitive outgroups, and so if you're not part of the in-group, then you can be treated, at, then you can be made a slave and be made permanently a slave. So much so that even if your master dies, you can be handed on to your master's son. Right? He can inherit you. Um, the end of slavery in Christianity is largely the success, or in, in the West, is largely the success of Christianity. It takes a while for us to work it out, but eventually things uh, are are put to rights, uh, and we do away with slavery in the West, by and large. Okay, what about resident aliens um, living amongst you? So if a stranger or sojourner with you becomes rich, and your brother besides him becomes poor, and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner with you, or to a member of the stranger's clan, then after he's sold, he may be redeemed, right? So God is saying that just because there's a, somebody, a foreigner living amongst Israel, who becomes rich and then buys an Israelite doesn't mean that that he can treat an Israelite as a permanent slave. Right? God's law uh, says that Israelites cannot be can never again be permanent slaves, and so it doesn't matter who bought the Israelite, then the right of redemption remains. So one of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncle or his cousin may redeem him, or a close relative from his clan may redeem him. So there's somebody paying off the debt, right, and freeing the man. Or if he grows rich. Right, slaves are. This is one of the things that's hard for us to understand um, with chattel, the chattel slavery system uh, that was in America. Um, slaves could earn, could have businesses, and could earn money. Right, so they owed something to their mas to their to their master. Right, but they could earn money. In fact, they could earn so much money that they could buy their own freedom. Right. So if he grows rich, he may redeem himself. He shall calculate with his buyer from the year when he was sold himself until the year of jubilee. And the price of his sale shall vary with the number of years, but the time he was with his owner shall be rated as the time of a hired worker, right? So how much do we decide uh, is left? How much to buy out the contract, right? Well, it's how much would you pay a hired worker to do the same thing that I'm doing for you, uh, and that's how much it is to buy out the contract. If there are still many years left, he shall pay proportionately for his redemption 
some of his sale price that there are, remain but a few years until the year Jubilee should calculate and pay for his redemption portion uh, to his years of service. He shall treat them uh, him as a hired uh, worker hired year by year. He shall not rule ruthlessly over him in your sight. And if he is not redeemed by these means, then he and his children with him shall be released in the year of Jubilee. Right? So it doesn't matter who, if this is a stranger, right, a resident alien, who is in essence uh, bought the right to the labor, right, of this man who's in debt, right, he still, because this is an Israelite, he's still subject to the laws of Israel's God, right? Living in Israel, buying an Israelite, if you're not an Israelite, still means you're subject, it means the year of Jubilee, the right of redemption, the kinsman redeemer, all of those things still apply. For it is to me that the people of Israel are servants, right? So ultimately, Israel belongs to God, which is why you can only rent them, you can't own them, right? These are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am your God. So since God is the one who has saved his people and delivered his people, therefore, they cannot become permanent slaves. So let's take a look uh, quickly at this passage in Hebrews chapter 4 as we get ready to close through. Um, we're going to cover this in more detail, obviously, in the coming weeks, but just a little bit of taste of Hebrews tonight. Therefore, while the promises of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we have believed, we who have believed enter that rest. As he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since, therefore, it remains to in, for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of the disobedience, again, he appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David, uh, so long afterward, and the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Right? So this idea is there is a, a permanent rest that we can enter into with God, a permanent state of jubilee. How does one enter into that state? Ah, I'm so glad you asked. Let's jump over to Luke chapter four. So Jesus goes into the synagogue of Capernaum and he takes the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. So scrolls go left to um, right, right? And so he unscrolled the scroll and found the place where it's written. So we think of that as very quickly, he's flipping in the page. This could have taken a long time scrolling through the text of Isaiah until finally he comes to this passage. That's not how rabbis taught at the time they would go up wherever the torah was they'd start where they where whoever last week left off right they'd read the next passage and then they teach on that passage that's how it used to work and here's how jesus did it he goes to the passage that he wants he says the spirit of the lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor he sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives covered sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the lord's favor the year of the lord's favor to proclaim Jubilee, right, to proclaim Jubilee. Rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the tenant, sat down, and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him, and he, and he began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, Jesus says, I am Jubilee. If you want to enter into the rest of God, we'll cover this much more extensively when we get to that section in Hebrews chapter four. You want to enter the rest of God, you will do so through the Jubilee who is Jesus himself. Right? Jesus is the one who puts all things to rights. He's the one that establishes justice. His grace is the way by which you come into the presence of God because his death on the cross paid for your sins. His blood covers you, so therefore you can come into the presence of God. That's the message right, that, that we are getting across here in the text. It is this idea uh, in, the in, in these uh chapters on Jubilee, that God is going to put things to rights, and he has a system for doing so that are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus himself. So let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for your Jubilee, who is Jesus, that we don't have to keep track of years and decades and make sure that we are following all of these laws, but rather that Jesus has established a permanent Jubilee, and that all who enter into Christ by faith are given the promise of your rest. 
that we no longer have to worry, Lord, what we shall eat or what we shall wear, for you know our needs before we even ask. So we pray, Father, for your provision in our lives, that we may return you the glory. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our eternal Savior. Amen.